my talk today, it just says Peter and the Rock on the schedule there, but it's actually Peter, the Rock, the Keys, and the Chair. Because these are three elements that when I was coming into the church were essential to me. My wife came into the church because of worship and the saints and devotions. I came into the church because of authority. I was a Bible alone guy, and that's why I enjoyed Marcus Grody's talk last night so much about that verse that he never saw in the Bible, and I'll have to tell you, it wasn't in my Bible either. <laughs> the church is the pillar and foundation of the faith. I never saw that verse either, and it's an amazing thing. We, we were going to write a book one time, a bunch of us, about all the verses that we never had in our Bible until we became Catholic. <laughs> but... I converted to the Catholic Church because of the issue of authority. My problem was is that I was a Bible alone guy, but even among my evangelical buddies, we couldn't agree on what it meant. We would argue and fight about it. And I could go on and talk about that for a while, but I want to get into the issue of the papacy. And the best way to understand the Bible and the church and the papacy is to go back in space and time. So in a way, I'm going to ask you to suspend your reality here and go back 2,000 years to the other side of the world. You don't speak English anymore. You speak Aramaic and Greek. You don't live in a democracy. You live in a kingdom. And I want you to put it through the, see this through the eyes of the first century Christians who were confronted with this new idea of a church, of a new kingdom, of a Messiah. The best way to study the Bible, people say, Steve, what's the best way to study the Bible? I say, read a passage, think up as many stupid questions as you can about that passage, and then look for answers. Find out. And another way is to realize, when you're trying to understand the church and Jesus and Mary, is to realize that there are really five Gospels, not only four. You think I'm a heretic. Marcus is already calling the security to get me out of here. There are five Gospels, and I don't mean the Gospel of Judas or the Gospel of Thomas, which we've heard a lot about, which are not Gospels, but I'm referring to what Pope Paul VI said when he went to the Holy Land. And he said, I have read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and now I am reading the fifth Gospel, which is the Holy Land. Because to understand Mary and Jesus and the beginnings of what we are as Catholics, a church, here we are sitting in America 2,000 years removed from the beginning with different language, different culture, different ideas, different governmental form, and it does us a tremendous disservice because we don't see it. We're looking at things as Americans in modern day times and you can't do that. You have to step back in time. So as a Catholic, Oh, by the way, you know, the best way I like to do this is I, I started running. People have, I've been asked 50 times already, did you lose weight? Because in my movies, I was a little plumper. And yes, I lost 30 pounds because I started eating right and exercising. I just realized the doctor said I had high this, high that, high that, and if I want to see my grandkids married, I had to do something. My wife and I said, God only gave us one body, and I want to serve him for a long time, and I'm not going to let physical things cut it short. So we started eating right and exercising. And one of the best ways that I see the fifth gospel is that when I'm in Israel, before I take our groups out in the morning, I take a run. And I run, the t five days ago, I ran from Jerusalem to Bethlehem and back to Jerusalem. And the day before that, we had eight runners in our group, and I said, you want to go for a run? I'll take you on a run of a lifetime. And they said, yeah, and they put on their shoes. We talk, uh, took off, and we ran around the old walls of the city. The city had stopped at every gate, ran in, prayed at the western wall, and then ran for an hour. But this is a great way to see the land. But to understand the Bible and the Catholic Church, you have to dig deep, and you have to go into history and into culture and ideas, and that's a little bit of what I want to do for you today. Now, in Ann Arbor, where I live, most of the time, um, when I'm home. But when I, in Ann Arbor, they used to, at the mall, they used to have these pictures in the malls, and they're called um, magic eyes. I don't know if you've ever seen them. I haven't seen them lately, but it looks like my grandkids splattered paint all over a piece of paper, and they said if you looked at it, you would see something, a, a unicorn flying over three, three pine trees, they said. And I looked at it, and I didn't see anything but splatters of paint. And I said they were crazy, and they had all of these pictures. And... My wife all of a sudden says, oh, I see it. There's a unicorn with three pine trees. And I thought she'd lost her mind. And I stood there for 15 minutes, and finally I saw it. And you know, this is what I'm talking about a little bit. You have to have eyes to see things. I would have said to you 
15 years ago, all right, Catholics, if you're so smart and you know your Bible so well, why don't you show me the Pope in the Bible? Show me the Pope in the Bible. Come on, right here, chapter and verse. First of all, there's a big problem with that because I assumed everything had to be found in the Bible. You're smarter than that. You know that that is not true, at least explicitly stated. The first thing I ask people who ask that question now is, where do you find in the Bible that I have to find everything in the Bible? <laughs> That's the first thing. When somebody says, where do you find this in the Bible, say, back up a step. You are, you are asserting something here that may not be the case. If everything has to be in the Bible, then why don't you show me in the Bible where it says everything has to be found in the Bible? Because that's not in the Bible. But I would have said, where do you find the Pope in the Bible? The word's not there. There's no Vatican's and Pope mobiles and cardinals and infallibility doctrines in the Bible. So why do you believe this? Why do you let some old man in Rome tell you what to do? Especially in your own bedroom. What is wrong with you Americans? Why do you follow the Pope? This is the land of the home and the free of the brave, and we have the Bible. Why do you let some dictator in Italy tell you what to do? And believe me, I wasn't saying that to be facetious. I believed that. I thought it was ridiculous. But where do you find the Pope in the Bible? Well, it's like the magic eyes. If you come to it as an American, not understanding the history, the culture, the language, not understanding the whole history of the church, you may not see it. You may just see splatters of words on a page. But if you have eyes to see, and if you understand the Bible in its context, both historical and textual, you will see the Pope jump out just like a unicorn flying over three pine trees. And so I want to start by going back on a journey to the land of Jesus, to the very beginning of time of the church. And let's see what we can find about the Pope and whether it was intended to be what we are. And I'll give you a little hint up front it is because that's why I'm up here and proud to be a Catholic today. I want to start with the rock and then we'll go to the keys and then to the chair and if I have enough time I'll tell you a story about a ship and some rafts. But first of all the rock Jesus took his disciples on a long walk. It says that he went into the district of Caesarea Philippi. This is in Matthew chapter 16. Now, all of you people say Catholics don't know the Bible, so I'm going to do a little test here. I'm going to say a phrase, and I want you to finish it, all right? You are Peter and... You guys know the Bible. Oh, most of you are converts. That's what that's I mean. <laughs> But even if I'm in a room that's full of cradle Catholics and I say this, they know how to finish the verse. You'd be amazed. I can quote a half a verse and they can finish it. You know the problem is they just don't know where to find it. They know what it says. Catholics have a good instinct about what the truth is, about what the Bible teaches, but if you ask them where it is, they don't know. See, when I learned John 3.16 as a boy, John 3.16 was part of the verse. Because you had to know that in case you were talking to a Catholic. <laughs> because you knew they didn't know, and so you could win a few points right there by knowing where it was. But in Matthew chapter 16, it says that Jesus took his disciples into the district of Caesarea Philippi. Now stop right there. How do you study the Bible? You ask as many stupid questions as you can, and you look for the answers. Two good ones here. Why does it say he went to Caesarea Philippi? It's not necessary, is it? <clears throat> mm -hmm. And why and what was there special about Caesarea Philippi that made this important? And I'm going to tell you. He took them into the district of Caesarea Philippi. Now, if Israel is like, it's a long, skinny country, the size of New Jersey, only 8,000 square miles. It's a little country. Sure makes the news bigger than it is. And if Jerusalem is here in the middle... That's where the temple was. That's where the doctors of the law was. Where that's where the throbbing, pulsing life of Judaism was down here. This is where it was clean, so to speak, and holy. But they're way up uh, 60 to 80 miles up by the Sea of Galilee up here. And that was called the land of darkness, the land of the Gentiles. And yet there were still communities of Jews with synagogues there. But Jesus and his disciples went probably three days. It takes us an hour and a half to get there on a Mercedes bus. So how long would it take to walk? 
two or three days. I'm going to try it sometime so I can give you the accurate days. But they went from Galilee all the way to the very tip of Israel. Today it's right on the Lebanese border. And up there, you were as far away from Jerusalem as you can get and still be in the Holy Land in Israel. You are now right on the border. You are in pagan territory. And at the time of Jesus, this place, Caesarea Philippi, was the capital of Caesar, Philip, I mean Philip, who was the um, tetrarch of the area. And he named it after himself. But there was a place there, a rock, and I'll tell you about it, but it was a place of pagan worship. Why would Jesus go to such a place? And I think the answer is, is because he was very smart. He was a good teacher. You know, if you're a good teacher, you know that you need to use props and visuals. You need to show things to people. Like a coin, Jesus says, whose image is on this coin. Look at the rocks of the field. Look at the sower who went out to sow. All the time, Jesus is using these marvelous stories because he knows how our brains work, how we learn with images, with visuals. And there's no greater backdrop or visual to any of Jesus' teaching than at Caesarea Philippi, I'm convinced of it. So Jesus is on the way, and when they get there, he says to his disciples, who do men say that I am? And they say, some say John the Baptist, Elijah, one of the prophets. And Jesus says, who do you say that I am? And Peter, the one that always blurts things out, the first one, he got it right. You know, a couple of verses later, Jesus says, Get thee behind me, Satan. In one chapter, he says to Peter, You received this as a revelation from God. And a few ch verses later, Peter says, No one's going to crucify you. And he says, Get you behind me, Satan. But here, Peter got it right. He says, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus says, Very good, Peter. You did good. This time. <laughs> Thank you for defining me. You did not get this from your own head or from anything you've learned by walking around or in school or in the synagogue. You did not learn this from fresh, flesh and bread. You received this from my Father who is in heaven. Thank you for defining me, Peter. And now I'm going to return your favor and I am going to define you. Peter had defined Jesus. Jesus was now returning the favor, and he is going to define Peter. But he wasn't called Peter yet. He was called Simon. I am going to define you. You are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church. Now let's take that apart a little bit. In English, we lose the word play. Peter, rock, so what? What does that prove, Catholics? If you said it in French, you are Pierre, and in Pierre, on this Pierre, I will build my church, because the word name Pierre means rock. Rock and Pierre are the same. How did we get Peter from rock? Well, let's go back one language, okay? We're in English now. Doesn't make sense. The word play is gone, but let's go back to the language it was written in in Matthew. Matthew wrote the Gospels from what the early church father said, first in Hebrew, and was later translated into, er into Greek. But let's read what it says in the Greek. It says, you are Petros, and on this Petra, I will build my church. Aha, gotcha, Catholic. It's not the same word. See, Jesus must have been saying, you are Petros, and on this Petra, I will build my church. No scholar holds to that, by the way. What Jesus did was change the name. Petra is a, one of those Romantic languages like Spanish that has feminine and masculine nouns. The word rock, Petra, is a feminine noun. He couldn't call him Petra. He's a big, bald, burly fisherman. My name is Stephen. I wouldn't appreciate it if you called me Stephanie. I'd go home. He couldn't call him Petra. Petra is a word for rock, but it's a feminine. Jesus changes the word Petra and makes a masculine out of the word Petra so that he could give him a masculine name, rock. But Jesus didn't say it in Greek. That's how Matthew translates it for us in the New Testament. Jesus spoke Aramaic. Did you know that when the Holy Family woke up in the morning in their cave in Nazareth, Mary, Joseph, and Jesus said, good morning, in Aramaic. 
And Jesus spoke the common language of the Jews of the day. They spoke Hebrew in the synagogues and in the schools and when they were reading the Torah scrolls. But when they were on everyday life, they spoke Aramaic. And in Aramaic, the word for rock is kepha. Have you read Cephas in the Bible? The word Cephas, that's this word kepha. So when Jesus spoke to Peter in Aramaic, he said, you are kepha, and on this kepha I will build my church. Do you remember what the first thing Jesus said to Simon when he met him in John chapter 1, verse 42? He said, oh, Simon, you will be called Cephas. You will be called Kepha, the rock. Peter probably said, oh yeah, okay. If you say so. Three years later, he gets the name. So that's the origin of that name, Kepha, Peter. Name changes are very important in the Bible. They're not so important to us today. But name changes there. A name was a description. It was who you were. Abram had the name Abram. And do you know what the name means? Father. But at 99 years old, he still has no children. Can you imagine when names are more important? Hello, who are you? Abram. Oh, you're a father. Yes, where's your kids? Don't have any. <laughs> then why are you called Abram? Ask my mom. <laughs> and then God comes to him. He's 99 years old and he still has no children. And he says, I'm going to give you a covenant. I'm going to change your name. First of all, the sign of the covenant. I think Abraham was thinking, oh good, I'm finally going to get something out of this deal. I still don't have any land. I don't have a kid. Now he's going to give me a sign of the covenant. Great, what is it, God? And he hands him a flint knife and says, Abram, cut it off. This is the circumcision. This is the sign of the covenant. And then he says, I'm going to change your name. And if the flint knife wasn't cruel enough, he says, I'm changing your name now to Abraham. And what does Abraham mean? Father of nations. <laughs> But then God blessed him and gave him a son, and his son became the father of nations. A name change is significant. You know, Mary, we call her Mary, and even in the rosary, we say, Hail Mary, full of grace. But you know, you go look in the Bible for that word name Mary in that passage. It's not there. What God said was, the angel said, from God, is Hail, Kahare Tomene. Hail, you who have been made full of grace. And Pope John Paul II said that that was Mary's name in the eyes of God. A name change, Kahare Tomene, the one who is made full of grace. Now Peter is being given a new name. It is very significant to be given the name Rock. No one had been given the name Rock before. That was not a name. It was now a new name that no one had before. Because Jesus was making a point that I'm going to make you the rock, the foundation. And when he made Peter the rock, he did not just make Peter the rock, but he created an office, which we'll get to in a moment. Now, I want to tell you about this rock. When we drive the bus around the corner, I've been there over 50 times. And when I get there, I still, the hair still goes up on the back of my neck and I get goosebumps because this is such a magnificent sight. And you can see pictures of it on my website. It's catholicconvert.com, by the way. I love that title, uh, the web name, you know, catholicconvert.com. But I have pictures of it up there. And when you drive around the corner, the first thing you see is this huge rock. It's the foothills of Mount Hermon. And there in the middle of it, on the left a little bit, is a huge cave. And then to the right are niches carved in this rock where pagan idols used to be placed right inside the rock. It's about 500 feet long and at least 50 to 100 feet high. It's very impressive. And Jesus came here to make this announcement because of the, the, just the magnificence of this backdrop. And when you understand it, you say, of course, where else could he have said this? My favorite place to give this talk is at that place, right in front of the rock. And I did it one time with a, there's a little, like, little amphitheater, you know, a few seats, and I have all my people sitting there. And then there was another one. I just did this 10 days ago with a group. And then there was another little amphitheater over to the right, and a, a group of Baptists walk in, and they were sitting over there. And I knew they were Baptists. See, I was one. I can spot them a mile away. <laughs> and so I'm sitting there talking to my group on how Peter and the rock, and I said, I know what they're talking about. Would you excuse me? I just got to go confirm it. So I kind of scooched over there, and I listened, and sure enough, I heard this. <laughs> 
and our Roman Catholic friends, they'll tell you Peter is the rock. But that's because they don't know their Bibles. I still have a scar on my tongue. Ugh! I was polite. So this rock is magnificent. And in the time of Jesus when he arrived, I don't think he came up to this rock. I think he stood a distance off on the hillside just beyond it and looked down on this rock because it was a pagan site. And this was the place where pagan worship was taking place. And there were probably orgies and unholy masses, if you want to call it, going on in front of these statues. And what Jesus would have seen was a white temple built right in front of the cave. A huge cave is there. I mean, it's a huge cave. And in the first century, Josephus, the Roman writer, the Jewish writer who was writing for the Romans, says that there was water in the bottom of the cave. And he says many times people have taken a rope and put a weight, a stone, and lowered it down, 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 and they could never find the bottom of the cave. And so the pagans considered it the entrance to the netherworld. Caves. In ancient times, deep caves were considered an entrance into Hades or into the netherworld where the gods in the supernatural world. And Jesus said, you are rock, and on this rock I'll build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Why did he say this? Because there is the gate into the netherworlds. The white marble temple that stood right in front of this. It was built by Herod the Great before Jesus' time. And it was made of imported marble. It was beautiful. You could see it glowing, gleaming in the sunlight before you even got close. And there you came to worship what? Caesar as Lord. Caesar was considered the Prince of Peace. He was divine. He was the Lord. And people came there to this temple devoted to Caesar Augustus. And there are still, you can see, where there are concave areas where they put the statues. And you would walk through the temple and you'd give obeisance to the statues and you'd worship Caesar as Lord. You'd pinch incense to the genius of the emperor and then you would throw your living sacrifice into the cave, into the water below. This is all described by Josephus. And they would throw the living sacrifice into the water. And if blood came out, oh, I didn't tell you this. There's so many things I wish I was there showing you because it's easier that way. But underneath the cave was flowing a river of water. It's one of the headwaters of the Jordan River. When you see the Jordan River and say, where does it come from? It comes out of that cave up there at Caesarea Philippi, one of three sources. And you'd throw the living sacrifice in. And if blood came out and the water underneath the rock, then you would know that the gods rejected your sacrifice. But if there was no blood, then the gods had accepted your sacrifice, which is the opposite of Christianity in which we read in the Hebrews that without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. So you would walk through this temple and you would throw the living sacrifice into the gods that were down below, the gates of hell. Now, you have a false rock with a false church. And you're worshiping what? A false lord. Now this was the false lord. I want to touch on that a little bit more. That was a real problem for Christians in the first century to have to pinch incense to the Caesar and acknowledge him as the Lord. You could worship Jesus and Zeus and Aphrodite and Artemis and all the other gods. It doesn't matter as long as you agreed that Caesar was divine. That was the glue of the empire. All the nations, all the countries that came under the Roman Empire had to acknowledge Caesar as Lord and pledge allegiance to him. You didn't have to believe it. You could even cross your fingers and pinch the incense. They'd give you a certificate. Now imagine what the Christians faced when they were in the first and second centuries. Why were they persecuted? Because imagine those two doors are now locked. Bam, they're shut. And Roman soldiers are there with their swords and none of us are leaving until we make a decision. And they set up one guy over here and one soldier there and they say, get into one of these two lines right now, every one of you into one of these two lines. Here we have an altar, and on this altar you will pinch incense to the Caesar, to the genius and the divinity of the Roman emperor. And you don't have to believe it. Come with both hands crossed behind your back. We won't look. And when you do, we'll sign your certificate and you can go. But if you refuse to do this, then you step over here and there's a chopping block and a big guy with tattoos and a ring in his nose and he's going to cut off your head. 
if you refuse to acknowledge Caesar as Lord? Which line would you get in? Think for just a minute. Which line would you get into? You would say, oh, I have grandchildren that depend on me, and a wife and a husband, and I have a mortgage to pay, and I have a business I'm running. I, I have to get in this line. I'm just going to cross my fingers. God will understand. Oh, but then you get over here in this line, and there's a few priests here who know that they're probably going to be martyrs someday. I tell young seminarians, when you become a priest today, you're going to put a bullseye on your chest because of the way our country and the world is going. And the priest, as he gets up and he comes over to this line, he yells back over to you, remember the words of our Lord. If you deny me before men, I will deny you before my Father in heaven. Do you want to reconsider which line you're in? This is what faced the first Christians. This is the decisions they had to make. This is why they were eaten by lions and burned at the stake and had be cut off their heads with swords. So Jesus is now saying, you are Peter and on this rock I will build my church. In other words, this is a false rock with a false church to a false Lord and I'm going to establish a new church on a new rock of Peter and it will, you will worship the true Lord. And the water that rushes out from under that cave, what does it do? You know that 70% of the water used in Israel comes out of the Sea of Galilee. Whether you're in Haifa or Tel Aviv or Beersheba or Jerusalem, 70% of the water you use comes out of the Sea of Galilee. I said to the pilgrims last week, I said, every time you flush the toilet, the water goes down in the Sea of Galilee. He said, good, I'm glad it doesn't go up. <laughs> The water that flows out from under that rock is the water that has sustained the people of God and made Israel into a garden. What is the water that flows from the rock of Peter? The rock of Peter has water that's flowing from it. It is true and pure teaching which we can trust even 2,000 years later. It is the sacraments from the church that flow out with the grace of God like a huge like a huge pipeline from heaven just pouring out on us all the time, freely and graciously given, even when we don't deserve it. And what else? It is the Holy Spirit that flows from the church. These are, you look at this rock, and there you have a, a now a true rock, Peter, with the true church, worshiping the true Lord, and out from it flows the water of the Holy Spirit and the grace of God. There's so much more I could say about that, but I want to move on to one other aspect of that rock before I get to the keys. If you were to ask today to a taxi driver, take me up to Caesarea Philippi, he would look at you puzzled. He doesn't know where that is because it's not called Caesarea Philippi anymore. It was only called Caesarea Philippi for a few short years. Before that, it was called Panias, and today it's called Banias. You have to tell the taxi driver, take me to Banias. Oh, then he knows. Then he'll take you. The reason being is that in the niches I told you about, over to the side, big niches, you can stand in them. My son-in-law was finishing his PhD at Catholic University in theology, and he went and sat in one of them and said, I am the God. You know, he's pretending to be funny. I have pictures of them there, but they're big enough where you can go and sit. There are big statues, in there. and do you know who the number one God was, the big God that they put in there? And people came from all over the Roman Empire and the whole Near East to worship at this place, the God Pan, P-A-N. It was world famous as the place, the shrine of Pan. He was the goat, you know, with a back goat and a, uh, the head of a man, and he'd play his flute and chase the girls through the woods. That's where we get the word panic and pandemonium. And they came there to worship him. And do you know he was represented the god of several things, but the number one thing that he was the god of was the god of sheep and shepherds. What is Jesus doing here? Think about the implications of a false rock, false temple, false lord, and now there's a false god of sheep and shepherds. Who is the true shepherd? Jesus, and he's God. Where's the true god of sheep and shepherds standing right in front of you with Jewish sandals on? And what is he doing? 
he's appointing his deputy shepherd who is going to be over his flock because Jesus intends to go away. Where? To heaven. John chapter 14. I go to prepare a place for you. Thomas says, how are we going to get there? Jesus said, don't worry, I'll come back and get you. I'm going to prepare a place and I'll come back. But in the meantime, I need a shepherd to take care of my flock. Right in front of the false god of sheep and shepherds. Now, that's why it was called Panyas means the city of Pan. And today, because in Arabic there is no p -p, p p p p sound, it comes out as a B. That's why it's called Banyas today. But right there, if you just even know that name, it is a testimony to what Jesus is doing at the place where the god Pan was. Jesus is appointing a new god of sheep and shepherds, himself and his new deputy. And there it is, right in the geography and the language and the culture. You know, if our kids knew this, they wouldn't leave the Catholic Church when they get older. If our kids understood the beauty of the faith and the richness of all of these things, if they were taught this in CCD class and in RCIA class and as they're growing up, our kids would not be so quick and ready to leave the Catholic Church, which we're going to lose half of them at least by the time they get out of college. Now, there's another thing I want to touch on because time is oh, woefully short. Keys. Jesus said at the same place, I will give you the keys of the kingdom. What does he mean by keys? I thought I knew as an evangelical. It's the gospel. God gives them to everybody. If he gave me the keys, and here's what they are. The keys are like Peter opening the gates of heaven, right? With the keys. But I can do that too. Get a group of Catholics together. I preach to them the gospel that they must accept Jesus as their Lord and Savior and ask him in their heart and leave the Catholic Church. And if they accept my gospel that I've told them, I just open the gates of heaven and use the keys. The keys are the gospel. Oh, but I'm not. that's the way an American thinks. Not the way a Jew thinks. What did the Jew think when they heard, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven? They would have immediately thought Isaiah 22, verse 22. There was a royal steward. The king had a royal steward. He's going back. See, Peter is thinking in terms of Israel and the Davidic monarchy and the kings. He's not thinking of democracy in America. He goes back to those times with the kings during the, the, you know, Solomon and Rehoboam and Jeroboam, and they had keys, and they wore them over their shoulders. And the king could sleep in in the morning because his royal steward, his second in command, would go out and open the kingdom gates and open the royal treasury. And it even says one time David slept until, until evening. That was the day he got in trouble with Bathsheba. See, he shouldn't have stayed in bed that long. But the royal steward was the second in command. And Isaiah 22 talks about Shebna, the royal steward, who had a special robe. He had a special office. He carried the keys. He was called father, even. He was called the father of Jerusalem. This is a prefiguring of the pope. And he wore the keys. Now, the keys back in those days were bigger. The Romans invented the smaller keys. I have some up here. I'll have them on my table if you want to see. These are first century Roman keys. I'm glad they invented these. Now we have these silly kind of keys. I like these even better. But the, Rome, but the keys of the times of the Israelites, they were like two-by-fours because the gates were thick and they'd have a hole in the gate and you'd have to have this long two-by-four kind of a key with prongs on the end and you'd slide it through and flip the latch on the other side and open the city gates. So whoever was wearing those keys over his shoulder, everybody knew who he was and they had to bow to him as he walked through the streets and he represented the king. And Jesus is saying, I'm going to give you the keys of the kingdom. The this is what the disciples understood the keys of the kingdom to mean. That he was, Jesus was the king. What did Jesus say to the little 14-year-old girl, I mean the angel, when he darkened the entrance of her cave and called her Kahare Tomene, which we mentioned, he said that you will give birth to a son, his name will be Jesus, and he will sit on the throne of his father David. He's going to be a king. And as a king, he'll need a royal steward. He'll also need a queen. And guess who the queen was? The queen was never the wife. The queen was always the mother. I think when Mary heard the angel say, your son is going to sit on the throne of David, one of her first thoughts was, oh my goodness, I'm going to be a queen. Because she knew her Bible and her culture and her history. So, Jesus is the king. He's going to leave on a journey. He's going to delegate his keys to his vice president, to his vizier, major domo, over the house, his royal steward. And Peter, this is immediately what would 
come to their mind based on the Old Testament, based on their culture of living in a monarchy. And what do keys represent? Now, you know, when Jesus gave them to Peter, he gave them, if you read in the Greek, it's singular. I give them to you, singular in the Greek. Now, down south, they have this great thing that they do with the word you that I'm trying to get instituted in Michigan. If there's only one of us, it's you. If there's a couple, it's y'all. And if there's a whole bunch like this room, it's all y'all. And I, I'm trying to get it going in Michigan. It's, I'm not being very successful, but I think it's very good. When Jesus said to Peter, I give you the keys of the kingdom, he didn't say I'm giving all y'all the keys. He's giving them to Peter. And what do keys represent? Remember this. Keys represent exclusive dominion. Can I go right now into your car and go live in your house for a month? No. Because you have the keys. They represent your ownership. I can't go get in your car and go to your house and take it over for a month. But if you say to me, Steve, we're going away on a vacation for a month. Here are the keys for my car. Here are the keys for my house. Would you please go stay there and take care of our house while we're gone? Then as a deputy, as a substitute, I go there and take care of your house for you. But when you come home, what do I do with the keys? I don't own them. You own them. You have exclusive dominion. I give them back to you. There's this great painting in Rome, the only one I've seen of Peter giving the keys away. In Rome, wherever you go, when I take my groups, I say, there again, there again, there again. Peter is always clutching the keys. He's going to take this job seriously. Jesus gave me these keys, and no one's going to take them away from me. I'm going to do my job. And he has for 2,000 years, thanks be to God. But in this painting, he's giving the keys away. It's in the judgment scene in the Sistine Chapel. And who's he giving them to? Jesus. Why? Because it's the end of time. We don't need a pope anymore. The one who has carried the delegated keys is now giving them back to their owner. Now, you know that painting has a funny part to it, too. I shouldn't digress because I'm running out of time, but I, I will. So I'll do it quick. There was a cardinal who did not like the way that Michelangelo was painting that because he was painting people with no pants on. And he said they should be covered. And he went to the Pope to complain and made a big fuss. And so Michelangelo was really irritated by him. So he painted the face of that cardinal down in hell <laughs> on the bottom right-hand corner. Not only that, but the serpent was wrapped around his legs, biting the appropriate parts to, <laughs> to make his point. And the cardinal came in one day and looked at the picture, and he's still angry, but all of a sudden, <gasps> he sees himself down there in hell. And he goes straight to the Pope, and he says, you tell Michelangelo to take me out of hell. <laughs> and the Pope said, if he had painted you in purgatory, there's something I could have done. But once you're in hell, there's nothing I can do for you. <laughs> and that's a true story, by the way. Those are the kind of things I love to tell groups, you know, make a pilgrimage fun. But anyway, Peter has the keys, and it represents exclusive dominion. And there's only one church. And if you want to know what happens at the end of time, where's Jesus now? He is seated at the right hand of the Father. And at the end of time, we'll all be up there with him, and Peter will give those keys back. But in the meantime, thanks be to God, there is a man seated upon the chair of Peter with those keys. Now that brings me to the issue of succession because even as many evangelicals will agree that Peter was given the keys and he had a special place, but once Peter died, that was the end of it. They'll stop at the issue of succession. But I have to say this. If you understand it in the context of Israel, that it was an office and that it was a, called a dynastic office. When the king died, a new king would take his place, his son. When a royal steward died, it wasn't his son, but another one would be pointed sometimes within the family, and it was called a dynastic succession within Israel. So when they said, when Jesus said, I will give Peter the keys of the kingdom, they assumed that it would pass on from one to the, to the next in succession. It wouldn't just die. When Abraham Lincoln and President Kennedy were both killed, what did, what did America think about the most? Who was going to succeed them? Did the 
seal of the presidency fall from the wall and say, oh well, no more presidency, he died. Of course not. When George Washington died, he was succeeded in office. It was understood in the Jewish context of a monarchy that if a royal steward were to die or even be replaced from office, someone else would receive his keys and it would go on and on and on. You don't throw the keys away. It's an office. And succession is the handing of that on. And I can't say more than that other than what was said last night. That by Ken Howell, a good friend of mine. Oh, I love listening to him talk. He's a great speaker, brilliant man. I'm glad to count him my friend. That he was reading from Clement, who said that the apostles taught us. We were taught by the apostles that when these men as bishops died, others were to succeed them in their holy office. It was understood by the early Christians. Why didn't I understand it as a Baptist? Because I had my Baptist glasses on. I couldn't see it. You have everybody wears a pair of glasses. You look at life through a lens, through a perspective, through a tradition. Nobody looks at the Bible or at life objectively. I said that I studied the Bible alone, but that wasn't true. You know why? Because I was taught Baptist theology by my mom and dad before I could ever read. I started reading the Bible through the lens of my Baptist tradition. I have very special glasses now. I went to a new optometrist. <laughs> this is a Jewish lens and this is a Catholic lens. And I admit that I look at the world through a tradition because I'm admitting that everybody in the world does. I just have the right prescription now. And guess what? The world's no longer fuzzy. It's all clear. If you don't have those glasses yet, come see me. I'll tell you how to get them. <laughs> then comes the issue of the chair. We have the chair of Peter. Where did that begin? Did somebody in the early church just say, hey, that looks like a good-looking chair. Let's put the Pope in there and say that whenever he sits there, he's always right. <laughs> that makes life easy. People are gullible. They'll believe it. There'll be some Protestants later who will reject it, but most people will believe it. So let's put him in that chair and say whatever he says in that chair is infallible, and we can solve a lot of problems. Well, that's not how it started. I want to go back to where it started because this is the third point and I'm still going to try and get the ship and the rafts in. So around 1200, 1500 BC, Moses led the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt and they went to Mount Sinai and he went up on the mountain and he spoke with God and he came down with the Ten Commandments. And oh, this is a good time for another joke. Who's the first man who broke all Ten Commandments? At one time. Moses, right. That's a bad one, I know. But it's good for a Sunday school class or something. When Moses came down from the mountain, he had every rabbi, you go look it up in the Jewish literature. When Moses came down from Mount Sinai, he had three things. He had the written word of God on stone. He had the oral tradition, the oral Torah, which was never written down. Not until the second century AD did they start to write down what they remembered of it had been passed on in what's called the Mishnah and the Talmud. Read those, by the way, if you want to understand the Bible, how Jews thought of Scripture. It's fascinating. And he, they said that he had the written word of God on stone, the oral tradition, and a teaching authority in which he was virtually infallible. It says in Exodus 18 that Moses took his seat among the people and he judged them day and night. They came to him and said, Moses, what does God expect of us? What should I do in this situation? And Moses sat in the chair of Moses in the wilderness. And that tradition carried on. Do you know if I was a Jew, an Orthodox Jew speaking to you, I would be sitting down, not standing up. They sit down when they teach. And Jesus says in Matthew 23, 2, the scribes and the Pharisees, they sit in the chair, cathedra. They sit in the cathedra, the chair of Moses. Therefore, do whatever they tell you. Don't do what they do because they're hypocrites. But do what they tell you when they teach you the word of God from the chair of Moses. We didn't inherit, we didn't invent the chair of Peter. 
Jesus just said, you have failed to live up to my commands and my laws. I am now the Jewish Messiah. I am changing. I am now instituting a new community. And what was the chair of Moses is now going to be the chair of Peter. And what you used to bind and loose, and by the way, the scribes and the Pharisees would bind and loose. There was Shimei and another one, and one was liberal and one was conservative. Does that ring a bell? I mean, it's like that all the way back. And when Shimei would bind, Hallel would loose. It was a way of making laws and judging and judging a law and forgiveness of sin. It was their authority as the representatives of God to bind and to loose, to forgive, to make laws, to adjudicate those laws. And Jesus said, you have failed to do it. So he says to the apostles, I give you the chair of Peter and to all y'all, the twelve, not all y'all, that would be just y'all, y'all have the power to bind and loose. That's like each one in their own diocese, the bishops. And they were given the authority to bind and loose. And so the chair was not invented by the Catholic Church in the Middle Ages, but it was inherited. It was something that was going on for 1,500 years before. So now, we as Catholics, the Pope Benedict XVI does not sit on a chair that's only 2,000 years old. He's sitting on a chair that's actually 3,500 years old because it inherited from the chair of Moses. The saints said, what was the true priest? Moses had the priesthood, and then the chair of Peter inherited the true priesthood during the time of Christ. And so the Christians, because we have had this chair, we have been able to trust the words of God, thus saith the Lord, for 3,500 years. Isn't that a blessing? I used to be my own pope. What church did I go to? The church of Steve. I was my own pope because there was no arbiter. Where was the pope? Where could I go? I had to make the decisions for myself. Who was arbiter if me and a brother in Christ argued? Now, I have the chair of Peter. Do you know that the chair of Peter was established and taught and understood 150 years before the New Testament was ever collected into a book? Cyprian of Carthage wrote, and he said, if you are not in union with the chair of Peter, can you even consider yourself a Christian? If you are not in the unity of the chair of Peter, can you even consider yourself in the faith? This was 250 AD. The canon of scripture wasn't completed and put together until almost 400. How did these people know how to live the Christian life? They had the bishops, they had the chair of Peter, which was established long before the Bible was ever put together infallibility. I just have to touch on that because I'm running out of time. But infallibility, this was another bugaboo for me. How can the Pope be perfect? Oh, it never says he was perfect. It never says he's impeccable. The Pope goes to confession. Yeah, I often wonder, what does a guy like him confess? I, I know what I confess. I wonder what this is. But he goes to confession. He's not impeccable. He knows he's a sinner. So how can God use him to give infallible definitions in the church? Well, Somebody said to me, you, the Pope can't be infallible because God could never use a sinful man to give an infallible definition if he's sinful. Well, the, contraire. Have you read the book of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John? Who were they written by? Sinful men, right? And yet they're inspired scripture. How could God use sinful men to write inspired scripture? That's harder to do than to have a sinful man just give a proper interpretation of it, isn't it? Of course it is. And so then I thought about it too. Remember Peter walked on the water and fell in? See, there's a picture. Peter's not infallible. He can't even walk on water. You know, all the other ones didn't even try. <laughs> the others all stayed in the boat. It was Peter who got out and tried, and he walked on the water for a ways before he sunk in. But then what happened? Jesus reached down and picked, up him, picked him up by the hand. And we don't think about it, but with Jesus holding his hand, he walked on the water all the way back to the boat. This is what infallibility is, not Peter's ability, because he'll sink every time. It's Jesus reaching down and assisting him. And I remember I said that Peter in one chapter said something very profound from a revelation from God, and then something very stupid is a revelation from the devil. Well, I realized that if Jesus could say to Peter, whatever you bind on earth, I will ratify in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth, I will ratify in heaven, in order to give a big mouth like that, that kind of a promise, he had to expect to intend superintend Peter's mouth every minute of his life from that point on. <laughs> the Holy Spirit superintends the mouth of men to create in them the ability to be infallible under the right conditions. Now, there's so many more things I want to say, but I'm going to close real quick 
By the way, I want to show you one other thing. The chair, of, uh, the chair, before I tell you about the rafts, remember the chair of Peter and the chair uh, that I said was 2,000 years old? Look at this. That's your history. That's your genealogy. That's all the popes from the beginning, Peter, Linus, Cletus, Clement, all the way down to John, Paul II, and Benedict. That's something you can be exceedingly proud of. If you start a Baptist church today, it's guaranteed within 20 years it's going to split three or four times. Look at this. And none of them ever spoke, taught error. None of them ever taught heresy. Look at this list of popes. Do you know that this is the longest existing office in the world? The Roman Empire came and fell. The barbarians came and fell. The Byzantine Empire fell. The Ottoman Empire fell. The British Empire fell. And guess what? We're going to fall someday, and it looks faster all the time. But always there has been a man seated on a chair of Peter in Rome. For 2,000 years, there is no institution or office that has existed longer than the papacy, and there will be a man sitting there teaching infallibly with the pure water flowing out from the rock. It'll be flowing there until the day Jesus comes back, if it's 10,000 years from now, because why? I'm not building the church. You're not building the church. Jesus is building his church, and because of that, I can trust it. And I'm glad to be a Catholic. I am so happy. Somebody says, oh, so you're going to submit to the yoke of Rome. You're going to cross the Tiber and submit to the yoke of Rome. And I said, yes, I am. And thanks for the title for my book. <laughs> That's where it came from. I said, you know, when a, a, a knight in shining armor was galloping through the land of Europe in the, Middle, in the Middle Ages on a white horse, the epitome of independence and freedom and the independence of, and justice and righteousness, when he's galloping along and he finds an amazing king and kingdom that is worthy of his obedience and fealty, guess what? That knight, in all of his independence and strength, gets off on his knees and he submits to that king and that kingdom, and I have found such a king and a kingdom, and I was proud to get off my arrogant high horse and submit. The first time I met a bishop was when I was not even a Catholic yet. I had already decided I'd read my way in, and we were at a mass, one of the first we'd ever gone to in our life, and the bishop was coming up the aisle, and I got out of my seat at the beginning of the mass, and I ran back, and I stopped the procession. I hugged the bishop and thanked him for letting me be a Catholic. I hugged him. I knelt and kissed his ring, and everybody's wondering, what is he doing? And I'm, I'm just blubbering all over the bishop and thanking him for being our, my pastor, because I did it, because it was the only time in my life I'd have a first opportunity to meet my pastor who was in the succession, apostolic succession from the apostles, and I knew who he was, and I would have followed him all the way into the Colosseum to be eaten by, by lions that day. And I wanted to kiss his ring because I'd never have another first opportunity. And I kissed his ring, and I thanked him for being a priest, and I wanted, I wanted everybody to know the whole world, all the angels and, de and the wicked spirits and the angels, and the devil himself to know that I was now submitting to the church of Rome and kissing my pastor's ring. And And I found out that our deacon had warned the bishop and said, we have a new convert here, and, <laughs> and we don't know what to expect, so be prepared for anything. <laughs> but if I have two minutes left, I know I'm a little over two minutes. I got started late, though, so I did keep track of this. The ship and the rafts, I'm going to conclude with this, because this, is, I think, puts it in a nutshell why I'm so proud to be a Catholic and why converting into the Catholic Church is important. It's not just another alternative. Imagine the founder of a country building an amazing ship to take people over to a new country he founded on the other side of the ocean. And he gathers them. He summons them special with a special invitation. Some come and some don't. But those who come arrive on the port and they see this beautiful ship prepared for them to go across the ocean. And they look across the ocean and they can already see the glow on the horizon of a city called the Celestial City. And they get on this ship, and it's so exciting, and they have the introductory meeting, and they meet the captain and the crew, and they're shown all of the navigational equipment and the documents so they know where they're going, and they're in good hands. And they've got food and showers, and they have all this wonderful stuff on the ship to get them across to the other side. And the ship is the church. The land they're being called from is the world. The captain is the pope. The clergy are the crew 
The navigational equipment are the scriptures and the tradition. And down below, there are places to take showers, baptism, get cleaned up, confession, a great meal provided every day, the Eucharist, all of these wonderful things. And the ship sets sail to songs, and everybody's happy. And to speed it up here a little bit, we get halfway across the ocean, and some people get disgruntled, and they say, who is this captain to be telling me what to do? And the crew isn't so friendly anymore, and they're getting bossy, and some of them aren't even that good, and the people aren't as friendly as they used to be, and some of them don't even smell so good anymore. And the captain's telling me what to do in my own cabin. He has no business to do that. And they all make a plot, and they go down below in the bottom of the boat, and they find wood, and they find ropes, and they lash them together, and they make rafts. And at night, they throw their rafts off the side of the boat, and they get off, and now they are free. No longer do they have to submit to this captain telling them what to do and what to believe. No longer do they have to eat that wretched food day after day. And no longer do they have to go take that shower and tell some guy what they did wrong. They're free. How many sh rafts are there floating now around the ship? 33,000 or who knows how many? You count them. I was my own. The closer those rafts stay to the ship, the better chance they have to get to the other side. And everything good that they have on the raft, where did they get it from? I didn't realize as a Protestant that everything I had good I had gotten from the ship. The canon of Scripture. I threw five sacraments out, but the two I had, where did I get them from? The definition of the Trinity and the hyperstatic union of the two natures of Christ. Where did I get this from? I didn't invent this. I didn't come up with it. I got it from the ship. But you know, I realized something later on, that I was not one of those who jumped off the ship. I was born on a raft. I didn't even know there was a ship. I thought this is the way God planned it. All of you get on your rafts and we'll see you on the other side. Take your suffering well. Then one day I see this big thing on the horizon. And I say to the raft, people on my raft, what's that? We don't want to talk about it. <laughs> so I yell to the raft next to me and the other, hey, what's that over there? We don't want to talk about it, we said. Why not? Because it's the ship. <laughs> what ship? What are you talking about ship? What am I doing out here on a raft if there's a ship? <laughs> Do you remember the rainstorm last night? I would have... Wait a minute, I said. I started reading the few scraps of information we had on our raft that we had taken from the ship. I started reading and thinking and asking questions, and before you know it, I get back on the ship. January, uh, May 22nd, 1994. My family and I, we got back on that ship. And I went straight to the captain, and I said, Captain, there are a bunch of we pronounce it wrong. It's not Protestant. It's Protestant. <laughs> Captain, there's a bunch of Protestants out there. They're rebels. Let's load up the cannons and blast them out of the water. <laughs> That's not what I said. I felt like it the first year or two because my wife, her first comment was, after going to our very first Mass, is, I am so angry. I said, why are you angry? She said, I'm angry at my Protestant past for lying to me, but I'm even more angry at the Catholics because they never told us we were wrong. They never explained this to us. My first reaction on the ship was, give me the biggest, loudest megaphone you have. <laughs> because I, my mom and dad are out there, my brothers and sisters out there, my brothers and sisters in Christ are out there, and I don't know, they may even love the Lord more than some of the people on this ship. They may love the founder of the country, but they don't know about this ship, and if they do, they've been lied to. Give me that megaphone, and I started for the rest of my life, I'm going to be doing this. I'm shouting off the bow of that ship to all of those who need to be called back into the fullness of the faith, because on that ship we have a captain, we have navigational equipment, we have the fullness of the faith, and if you want to get to heaven and you want to bring your families with you, you better be on the ship and don't ever try to get off. And thank you very much and God bless you.